started. <laughs> Welcome, Maury, from Nice. It's good to see you this morning. Let's all stand up. Can you hear your voice the Can we Tim, can you put a little bit of my um, over here? Monitor. Yeah, just slightly up. We can hear ourselves. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we want so grateful this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that you have made this day, oh God. And we will rejoice. That's what your word said, oh God, that we will rejoice and we will be glad. And that, Father God, that whatever things, Lord, that comes our way, whatever things, Father God, that happen in our lives, that we can still say and we can declare what your word said, rejoice. We have to rejoice because God is in the throne and God is in control in everything that happens in our lives. And Father, today, we commit everything to you. And we just ask you right now, God, just come. Just come and, and, and bless your people. Just come and minister to each and every one of us as we give you praise and we give you worship and glory today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Yeah, this song, one of our old uh, songs that we've uh, sang in this church, and was through Michael's preaching uh, la last week that just kind of uh, reminded me. And it said, trading my sorrows. We're going to do that this morning, amen? You know, the great exchange, the great uh, uh, trading that happened, happened on the cross. And we're going to do that this morning, amen?
thank you. That is what you ask from us, Lord. We just need to lay it down. We just need to lay it down, Father God, and trust you in everything. In Jesus' name. Amen. You want to do this one? House of the Lord. shout about Father God. Oh, there's countless blessings that you have done in our lives and we shout it today in the house of the Lord. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Sing the 
again and to believe that you will not fail us sometimes it looks like that we're failing it looks like that you are failing it looks like you are not answering our prayers and yet your word will never change because God will not change and I thank you Lord your word will never fail us Amen. just pray right now strengthen our faith Bring it to the place, Lord, that I believe. I believe what God's word is saying in my life and in my circumstances. And so therefore, he will not fail. Amen. I will proclaim your you, greatness, my God Amen. and King. Amen. I will thank you forever and ever. Every day I will thank you. I will praise you forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is great and is to be highly praised. His greatness is beyond understanding. Thank you, Lord. What you have done will be praised from one generation to the next. Yes. They will proclaim your mighty acts, mm -hmm. Lord. They will speak of your glory and majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. Thank you, Lord. People will speak of your mighty deeds, and I will proclaim your greatness. Mm -hmm. They will tell about all your goodness and sing about your kindness. The Lord is loving and merciful, slow to become angry and full of constant love. He is good to everyone. Amen. And he has compassion in all he has made. And we just thank you and praise you for that mercy and love and compassion and forgiveness this morning, dear Lord. And new life, Lord. Hallelujah. That you are the light of the world, Lord. Yes. In your life, we see light, Lord. Hallelujah. You want us a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway, Lord. We're so thankful this morning for Jesus. We're so thankful for the life that you've given us. And we just want to praise you for this lovely new day, for the sunshine, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that the sunshine in our house is from our Lord Jesus. We just bless your name. Amen. Amen.
is free indeed. Thank you, Father. We rejoice in that freedom. We rejoice in that freedom because that freedom is come from within, from the deepest of our hearts, God. And it is the spirit of freedom, church. Amen. Hallelujah. It is the spirit of freedom. You can't contain it. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that you have set us free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. So therefore, we thank you and we rejoice this morning for the freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I thank Amen. you, Lord. Without God, it does not understand. You understand everything that you suffer in all things of God. Lord, you not only God, but a God that does not grieve, the Lord, or does not experience emotion. You sent your son. Oh down, oh God. When the world says, What has God done for us? They have forgotten the Lord. And they are blinded. You gave your everything. The Lord, where the world will give you nothing. All you want is for them to accept you. Amen. your presence this morning, your abiding presence, not just in this place, from this place, but wherever we are, God, let your presence go before us. That's what we need, church, to have your day, is God's presence, and that we know the peace that surpasses all understanding is living and dwelling in our hearts. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. Let's enjoy the presence of the Lord. I just want to greet all the mothers today, since yearly there's always that, you know, Mother's Day, just to acknowledge and to honor all the mothers. I just want to encourage you, you know, continue to be strong in the Lord, and do not be dismayed, do not be fearful, for God is always with us. So, to all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day, and we do have a new mother, where's uh, Trina? I saw Trina there with a the baby. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Trina. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. That my phone has come in. Oh. Happy Mother's Day. I forgot to put my phone. Yes. Okay. Now, first of all, who is a visitor here? Would you put your hand up today for the first time? Okay, Eugene. Yes. yes. From Killarney. And Marley from the United States. And Sixtus from Ukraine. So there's a. Uh, if you want to greet afterwards, that's all very good. You know, it's, we really welcome you all. And if there's anyone else who's here for the first time, just um, we just want to welcome you big time. Give them a good day. I'm good to see others who are here. Um, Sometimes we don't see everyone every week, but if you're here, it's good to see you. Amen. Praise God. So um, lots of things are happening. Um, there's a lot of activity around the county uh, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. How many are sharing your faith on a regular basis? Just like we saw um, last Sunday, you know, pray the Lord of the harvest. That he would send forth laborers into his harvest fields and i was standing in my usual spot yesterday i wasn't preaching i was just downtown and i thought i need to get into the water again you know sometimes if you i was out there week after week after week but you know if you don't do it for on a consistent basis you get cold feet it's like getting into that water once again you know when you get to the baptismal waters and it's like freezing cold and you have to do it, but a little bit of a push, a little bit of just sharing. And there are opportunities. I'm not saying I don't share with people. I mean, there's 
countless opportunities to talk to people just as you're walking down the street just and i just entered the conversation throw a little bit out there to see what the response is you know do you have a christian background anything like that could start a conversation and just to see where that goes and and then get to share the gospel hopefully amen so amen so we're going to look at something this morning i just pray father god that you would um, well, we pray for the offering. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness in providing for this church, Lord God. And Lord God, for your blessing upon each and every person here, Lord God. Bring increase and bless them in Jesus' mighty name in every dimension, Lord God. Amen. We all the honor and glory for Jesus. And we pray for this word that goes forth this morning. God, that we have ears to hear what the word of God says. Speak to us, encourage us, lead us, guide us into all truth. And we pray by the Spirit of God, that Jesus will be glorified. All we talk about here. Amen. So, now, while we're doing this, by the way, the children next door are doing the same thing. Did you know that? Not quite on the same level, but they're doing colorings and learning stuff. And I think at the end, they're going to come in and do a song for us based upon what they learned today. Now, it's all based upon, we're only going to look at four verses and we're going to expound upon those verses, but it's from Matthew chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along. And uh, as always, we'll have something on the screen. Amen. So let's read this. It says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and when he had called his 12 apostles, 12 disciples, sir, when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebeus, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Simple enough. How many of you ever learned the, the names of the 12 apostles? You may have heard them, but it's not something you necessarily learn. But uh, it's interesting because when we last look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, Jesus was saying, look, the harvest is great. Look at all these people out here, and we need laborers. And you need to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest field. Did you remember that part? Okay. So then what does he do? He acts upon that and he calls to himself. What does it say there? And when he had called his 12 disciples to him. How many disciples did Jesus have at this time? Now you might think there's 12. There were probably lots more than 12. But out of these 12, you've got, out of these hundreds, maybe, we don't know the number, but out of all the disciples that are following him, there are others who are not mentioned here, he calls to himself 12, okay? And there may be a reason for that. For example, um, he could have been sending the, uh, selecting 12 because of the 12 tribes of Israel to be matching with that and say, you know, you're going to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, or it represents all of the people of God in a sense, when you have these 12 and it's very interesting that we see how they're written down here and not only that but we read that when he called his 12 disciples to him he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out power the word power probably not the greatest translation there in our bibles because it's actually a Greek word, which is exousia, which means authority. So he's given them authority over, it's not like they've got the actual physical power, any spiritual power in the sense, like I have more power than them in that sense, but it's the authority, isn't it? It's a delegated authority under somebody else. He has given to them this authority over unclean spirits that when they they speak, they're going to be casting them out. Okay, power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. You remember in the last section as well, we read in Matthew chapter 9, 
uh, verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease. And when you read that, you might think to yourself, there you go. Everyone who was sick and everyone who was diseased was healed, right? But more than likely, it's saying that every kind of sickness and every kind of disease, just like it says here in chapter 10, verse 1, and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Does that make sense? So there wasn't one single type of sickness or disease that was not healable. And not only did Jesus have that power, but when he gave, he gave that power or authority to his disciples. Can you imagine that? That they were given that authority to act, to act on his behalf. Now then, as we read through this list, it says here, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. Now you'll notice the way you read it. Listen to this. It's in little groups, isn't it? You've got groups of two. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, always first in the top of the list, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Then you've got the next group. James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite. And Judas Iscariot. Did you notice that they're always in groups of in little couplets or twos? Did you notice that? Yeah. That's also what we read over in Mark. Uh, where are we? Mark chapter 6, verse 7. It says that he sent them out. What? He began to send them out two by two and give them power over unclean spirits. And the next slide, you will see that there's actually a way in which you can pair them up. So you got Simon who's been paired up with Andrew. <laughs> Is his brother, isn't he? His brother. Then you got James is paired up with his brother John. And then you got Philip is paired up with Bartholomew. Now, Bartholomew, you might go, where? I, you know, who is this guy? Well, actually, have you come across the name Nathaniel before? Nathaniel is the guy that was called in John chapter one. And uh, it's probably the same person because he comes up in the list. He has to be that guy. Who else could it possibly be? And sometimes that's the way the lists work. So his name's also known as, just like Simon's called Peter, Bartholomew's other name is Nathaniel. And then you've got Thomas. He had his doubts about Matthew, but he was paired up with Matthew, Thomas. And Matthew's probably going to himself. That's me, by the way, the guy who wrote the book of Matthew. And then James is paired up with a guy who's got a double name. It's Labeus, Thaddeus, but also known as Judas, another Judas. And that's based on Luke chapter 6, verse 16, when it gives you another list of the disciples and it says Judas. So you got a Judas, the brother or son of James. And then last but not least, Simon, who gets paired up with Judas Iscariot. And you wonder, you know, did he want to be paired up with him? But that's the way it is, right? So you've got these groups together. Now, um, if I was to ask this question, now these are these are the 12. Right? Are there others? That's another question. We're going to ask that in a moment. Where are the women? Where are the women? Push it up. Oh, well. I, mean, I just don't get it. I don't get how there was a huge power grab and the women are not mentioned. They're not mentioned amongst the 12 disciples. And but there's, the but there's, the but there's, church gives for not having a misogyny. Really? There's women in the Bible, plenty of them. Why aren't they the apostles? Well, they're not amongst the apostles. Because That's always the power was grabbed by the people who wrote it. Mm, interesting thought. Well, I'm just list, telling you what's in the list of the 12 uh, disciples, and then we'll see later on where the women play a part. Okay? Women and men playing a part in the gospel message. Amen. Yeah. So, we have the apostles mentioned there, and there's 12 of them mentioned for a specific reason. Okay? We're not told here why, but let me ask you this. What does the word apostle mean? Does anyone know what the word apostle means? <laughs> sent one. Somebody who was sent. So if I was to ask the question, who is the number one apostle of all? John. Actually, Jesus. Actually, oh, okay, here we go. Now, so if we knew our Bibles really, really well, right, we would go to Hebrews chapter 3. And in Hebrews chapter 3, it says this. Okay, you ready for it? I'm going to turn to myself. Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So you're right. 
the number one apostle, because it simply means sent one. It means that the number one who's been sent is Jesus Christ. He said that himself in John chapter 17. Um, you can look at verse 25. We'll just have a quick look there. Jesus spoke about his being sent. 1725. Let me read it. It says, uh, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. So he recognizes I was sent into the world. Then also in John chapter 20, verse uh, 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So that's what it means to be sent. Now, if we were to ask the question, okay, if sent one means, if an apostle means sent one, how many of you have ever been sent? Told where to go? Or had, not, go to the shops for your mother? Go, to the, go and do an errand? If that's what it means, if all it means to be an apostle means to be a sent one, then there could be plenty of people who could say, I am sent. You could be sent by a missionary board. You could be sent by a church. You could be sent on air by some organization. You could be male or female in that case, right? So that means if all it means is to be sent, then there's plenty of people who say, I was sent, right? Is that the primary meaning of the word, though? Because if it's all to do with just being sent, it's really not just that. It's who is the one who's sending you? In the case of these 12 disciples that were picked out of all the ones that were there, okay? This is not the Great Commission, by the way. Jesus gave them authority. He was putting them at, on a special mission at this time. It's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission to go into all the world, okay, for all believers, okay, that wasn't until the end of Matthew's gospel. This is a smaller mission in the middle of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, remember, when he's giving them specific instructions. We'll see that next time. Specific instructions, who they're going to go to, who they're not going to go to, and their particular message that they're supposed to share. Okay, that's what they're doing in Matthew chapter 10. So, Here's the idea. There are only 12 that are selected on this occasion. And what happens later on? Well, let me tell you this. We see the last one on the list. If you go back to Matthew chapter 10, it says there, Simon uh, the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. So let me ask you this. What happened when Judas took his own life, betrayed Jesus and took his own life? What happened to the number of the 12? It went down to 11. Very good. Okay. And so when we go to the New Testament, um, we can see this quite a number of times. For example, in Acts, turn to Acts chapter 1. This is after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So the disciples have been, Jesus has risen. He's gone and ascended into heaven. And they are waiting for the empowering of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come upon the church. They're waiting for 10 days. And we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they entered, they went up into the upper room. We're in an upper room, so that's a, a similarity there. They went up into the upper room where they were staying. And it gives you a list. Look at the list. Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Matthew and uh, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, all, and with his brothers. By the way, that's just to let people know, in case you didn't know, his brothers did not believe on him during his earthly ministry, but here they are, his brothers, with the other disciples in the upper room, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. It says, with who? These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. They were all there in this upper room. And so how many are in the list of the disciples right there? Eleven. Okay. Now, the Holy Spirit must have been speaking to Peter because this is what we read in verse uh, 15, Acts 1.15. And in those days, Peter stood up 
in the midst of the disciples, altogether the number of names was about 120. How many disciples were there altogether at this time? In the upper room, we don't know if there was more, but there was 120 here, and said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Did you notice there, Judas was numbered with the disciples. In fact, did you know that, Ju now someone mentioned this in one of our Bible studies during the week, not this week though. It was that surprised, he was surprised to find out that Judas was actually working miracles. Did you know that? He was one of the disciples who went out healing the sick and casting out devils. So he was under Jesus's authority at that time. That's the only reason he was able to work the miracles. He was under Jesus' authority. Okay, he had part in this ministry. Then verse 18, now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle. This is a very graphic detail here given of what actually happened to uh, Judas. He burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. Good job, turn around here, isn't it? Uh, people who've got a weak stomach. And it became known to all those uh, dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. What Peter was doing is he was getting these scriptures coming to him and said, these scriptures mean something to us and we have got to fulfill what is said in the word of God. And it says there that let another take his office. And then he goes on in verse 21. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. What is he saying? He says, we've got to have a replacement for Judas. And we have to base it on, you know, that if you heard the, the same terms and conditions apply, we've got to have somebody who was here from the very beginning, from the very start of John's ministry. It says here, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. To that day when he was taken up from us, somebody who's been around a long time amongst these disciples in this group, somebody is going to have to replace him. And what did they do? It says, a witness of, with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias, not Matthew, Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen. How are they going to figure that out? To take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So there you have the 11 were there. Now he's numbered amongst them. That brings the number up to what? Well, okay. Then, of course, when the Holy Spirit's outpoured on the day of Pentecost, all these people are gathered together from all the different nations. Peter stands up in chapter 2, verse 14, and it says, but Peter standing up with the 11. How many does that make? Wow. Right. Standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So we see the number has been fulfilled and is significant number for a reason. And that is what happened now. All of that is for a reason to show that, well, some people actually say, well, they got it wrong, didn't they? They jumped the gun. How many of you, maybe you felt like that? They jumped the gun. They got in the flesh. They should have waited, you know, a few years until Saul of Tarsus got his conversion on the road to Damascus, because then they would have really had an apostle. Some people actually believe that. But the Bible never says that they made a mistake, they got it wrong. They simply followed the instructions that they felt and led by the Spirit of God, the Scriptures. They said, this is what we're going to do. And there's no place where it says they got it wrong. However, we do know that Paul 
who was, and that's by the way his Roman name, but his other name is Saul as a, as a Hebrew. He had his conversion on the road to Damascus, and the Lord spoke to him on that road and commissioned him. He appeared to him personally, just like he had appeared to the other disciples, and he spoke to him and commissioned him and gave him a special calling. If you go to Acts chapter 26, we'll just have a quick look there. This is what he says. This is a summary, one of, one of a few summaries that he gives of what happened. On the road to Damascus. Okay, so let me read uh, from, uh, I, I suppose I could read from verse 12. I know it may not be on the screen, but it says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul. Saul, because that's his Hebrew name. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goals. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And what was this? Did you hear the word send there? Send you. What does that mean? He's going to be an apostle. I'm sending you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So there's something happening there. He has a special commission. And if you notice throughout um, Paul's writings, how many times does he say, Paul, the apostle? Because he recognizes, I've been sent. And in fact, in the book of Romans, let me see if I can just find it there. Romans 11, verse 13, he says this. Uh, he says that he's especially called for this. Verse 13, Romans 11, 13, for I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I've magnified my ministry. He recognized the other disciples had a specific calling to a specific people. They were to go into all the world. But he was called to the Gentiles. However, that again is the great commission. That's to all the world. What we are reading about in Matthew, okay, is not the great commission. It's the specific mission at a specific time. Again, by the way, did you know that at no other time was another apostle replaced? So, for example, did you read in Acts chapter 12? Yeah, I hear that. Somebody knows their Bible. Okay. Is that you, Eddie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Acts chapter 12. Listen to this. Verse 1. Now about that time, this is a few years later, of course, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. So what's happening there? He's taken the life of one of the uh, Jameses, which James were not told there, but some would say it would be the, the one that was with Peter, James, and John, those three. Okay? Whatever James it was, he killed James, known as James. And did they replace, did they say, let's, let's, we have to get together once more, and now we're going to have to replace James, just like we did for Judas, we're going to have to replace James. They never did that. In fact, that proves something, okay? They never did it ever again. And not only that, the early church fathers, which are basically the disciples of the first disciples or the disciples of the apostles, you know, the first century believers, those who are down in history known as the church fathers, the early church fathers, they never call themselves apostles they never they said we're not in the same category as those guys no way whatsoever they never used the titles they never used the phrase they never referred to themselves as apostles prophets anything like that okay so that's kind of a, a punctures the balloon of the catholic church when they teach 
and believe that they have apostolic succession. Basically, oh, we can trace all our power and authority all the way back to the first pope or to the first disciples. There's just no line there whatsoever. It's totally made up, okay? And so the only disciples that were ever called like this were these 12 plus Paul. And if anybody else is called an apostle in the New Testament, it has to be in a lesser sense. It's not in the same sense, um, these ones, because here's the reason. These disciples who were called by Jesus on this particular, at this particular time were given not only power and authority to cast out the devils and to heal the sick, but they were also given the commission to write the scriptures and to teach and preach, okay? And that's a big deal. You might not think it's a big deal, but the problem is, and here's what I'm really trying to get at today, why we're just doing the small section, is because there are people running around today claiming to be apostles, claiming to be prophets, who claim that they have as much inspiration as the first apostles themselves. They have the same power, the same authority. So basically what they're saying is that there's no difference. If God can speak to that apostle, he can speak to me in exactly the same way. And they can claim all they want. There is an organization. Well, maybe it's not that organized. Has anyone ever heard of the NAR? And I mean that not the Northern Ireland way of saying NAR. NAR it means the New Apostolic Reformation. Anyone ever heard of that? Okay, some of you will have heard of that. It's because there's this idea, we need apostles and prophets today because without that in the church, we cannot be successful as a church. We need new apostles and new prophets. And there are actually organizations, when you see the title, if it's on Facebook or whether it's on their YouTube channel, apostle or prophet, there should be red flags popping up. Like, really? You're an apostle. And they, they will say, oh, but it's with a small a, of course. But if it's a small a, you're basically saying, I was sent. Well, who sent you? The missionary board? Your church sent you? Why bother saying it? What are you trying to prove by saying you're an apostle in the first place? Why didn't you say, I was sent by this church. I was sent on a mission. That's all I was to it. I was sent to plant the church. Why bother? Now, the reason why they do this, they'll bring up, of course, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to turn there real quick. And they will base their understanding on this. And it's true, it is, it is in the scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we read this. Because Jesus arose from the dead, he ascended on high, and it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, and some, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And what they're saying then is that, well, are we there yet? Folks, is the church there yet? Have we matured to such a degree? No. So whilst we haven't reached there yet, we need the apostles and prophets today just as much as they did back then. Sounds like a fair enough argument, doesn't it? And they'll say, you know, you can't just have a pastor and an evangelist and a teacher and, and disregard the other ministries. What about the five-fold ministry? I mean, come on. You're, and your church is missing out if you don't have an apostle. Your church is missing out if you don't have prophets. In fact, we are apostles and prophets, and we will willingly be over your church. That's the whole idea of the New Apostolic Reformation. We need these people, they'll tell us. And then I'll, they'll also turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being built together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. So what they're saying is, you know, we need those people because they put the foundations in place. But what the problem is that as far as many Bible commentators and many Christian people see, the foundation has already been laid. We don't need to lay, the, again, the foundation. It's already been laid. And the way I would read this is that we've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. 
And I would see that as the prophets of the Old Testament and all the scriptures that we have there. And then we have the apostles of the New Testament on all the scriptures that they have given us. And they've given us a solid foundation. Do you know if I want to hear an apostle, what I need to do? Or not go to the internet, not look someone up, not go to some place who's advertising himself as a, an apostle or prophet. Him or her, by the way, and there are plenty of them doing that. They could go for a walk in the park and come back with two times what they got in the New Testament. Yeah, it actually happens. People say, there was the revelation that I've got. And the thing is, it's on a par. You think they're on the golf course when they're getting this. It's on a par with the Bible. Because they'll say, I have the word of God. I am as inspired as they are. And there's a misunderstanding of the word inspiration. When I talk about inspiration, by the way, if I said, oh, I was out for a walk in the park the other day, and oh, I just took out my... Uh, you know, my my easel, my paintbrush, and I, I painted, oh, I had inspiration. Or I, I got my guitar and began to write a song. It was, I felt inspired. And then with a bit of perspiration, including with the inspiration, I wrote a masterpiece or produced something. That's the sort of inspiration that we can talk about. But that's not what they're talking about in the Bible when it talks about being inspired. And we'll come to that in just a second. But the whole idea is that there are people who are putting their words on the same level as scripture and that is a big problem okay and it's happening worldwide and i was talking to somebody from the seventh day adventist movement recently and they, they're like i said what about your founder ellen g white well is she inspired oh yes yeah, she's inspired yes i certainly believe she's inspired why because she got revelations from the holy spirit okay and, and she, she claims all these things are from the Holy Spirit, and therefore they're on the same level as well. She's not the only one. If we're going to criticize, how many of you think the Mormons are way off? The Mormons, the, they, what books have they got? The Book of Mormon, bomb, B O F, Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrines of Covenants, plus the Bible. Their Bible must be, but that thick. Okay, and we can criticize them and say, they've added to the Bible. And what about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Don't they have their governing body, okay, who claim to be God's mouthpieces today, constantly producing Watchtower and Awake magazines? Don't they? What else? How many apostles and prophets within Pentecostalism who claim the amount of revelation? I mean, if you were to write down everything that these people claim to have seen and claim to have heard, you'd have more than uh, the Bible would have been enormous. It's ridiculous. And the reason is because they've got a completely misunderstanding, uh, misunderstanding of what an apostle is. There are only 12 apostles plus Paul in the sense of being chosen by Jesus Christ and specific, uh, particularly on this particular mission in Matthew chapter 10. They were chosen for this particular job. Now, I'm going to finish off with coming to this one by 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy, all right? Second Timothy chapter three. This is a classic couple of verses, okay? It says in verse 16, all scripture. Someone's got me. All scripture is given by inspiration. There's the problem. Inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, third equipped for every good work. Now, inspiration. We usually pick it up wrong because the Greek word there is not the word that we use for inspired in the usual sense. It is literally, the, I, have to, I have to look for it, but it's the word theo neustos. Theo, God, neustos is breath, new uh, as in pneuma. Theo neustos means God breathed. It's breathed out by God. This is a, it's not that the disciples were feeling inspired. Not one of those apostles were inspired. It doesn't say that they were inspired. So we can't claim, well, if they were inspired, we can be inspired. It's not talking about the disciples being inspired. It was the it is God himself breathing it out. And all they did was wrote down as they were led by the Spirit of God to do so. 
And that's the only ones who are told to do so. And so we've got some of their writings. And as I said, if you want to hear from the, an apostle today, all you got to do is open up your Bible and you can read the New Testament. And you will see Matthew and you'll see who else you've got. Um, anyone else? Paul, John. There are some of them. And the other ones were written under the inspir under the under the inspir under the authority of the apostles. They were told, "Here's what you need to write." They got that information from the apostles. And so, all of what we got in the New Testament, the apostolic teaching and preaching. So, where's this? Lead us go. Uh, lead us to Matthew. Go back to Matthew again. These are the twelve disciples who were then called to be apostles, sent forth, and the reason why they were acting under the authority of somebody else, that gave them so much authority and power to be able to preach with authority. You know that what you're saying is the truth because you've been commanded by Jesus to do it. Can you imagine them saying, how do you know what you're saying is true? Well, Jesus has commissioned us. He gave us the authority, and we're doing it under his jurisdiction, under his authority. He deputized us, okay? And if everyone was deputized in the same way, then, then their words would mean really nothing. But they were specifically called to do that, okay? And uh, we have a different type of calling. There's nobody in the same category as these guys. And so, therefore, there's something special about these particular ones, okay? Okay, so that's what we have when we come to the New Testament. And all I want to say is that we need to be careful of anyone who's claiming to be an apostle and we have our fair share of them even right here in ireland even right here in kerry even right here in this town, there are people who actually claim to be apostles and prophets of jesus christ and what we need to do is say go to the word of god do not be deceived okay go by what the scriptures say and that is our authority scripture alone amen, amen. i want to close there but i do know that the, the children are they coming in they're ready to come and sing a song. And it's based upon these um, 12 apostles. Now, we, we, have a, we have some today um, about the disciples, about the verses that we... Uh, Michael was saying everything <laughs> in, uh, about in Matthew. So we have a song that the kids have prepared for all of us. Now, ready? There were twelve disciples, Jesus called to help him, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphus, Tadius, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. He has called us to has called us to we are his disciples i am one and you he has called us to he has called us to we are his disciples i am one and you one more time there were
God is calling to people today through the preaching of the gospel. And perhaps you're here today and you said, well, I'm hearing his calling, not only a calling people to himself and to be saved, but also if you're here and maybe God's calling you to a special ministry, a calling, there's plenty of work to be done in the kingdom of God. As we saw last time, um, the laborers are few. We are always struggling to find laborers. We need someone at the back desk, don't we, Kim? We need somebody for the projector. We need this, we need that, we need musicians. We've always got needs, Sunday school workers, you name it. There's always people um, needed for the service of God. So, so amen. Um, we thank God for that today. And if I um, uh, want to do a finishing song. <laughs> oh yeah, what what will we what will we finish off with today? We got any particular requests? Uh, G3, so I want to go back to Egypt. Well, it's a hard one to do. Do you want do you want to sing it? Uh, I can't sing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I know the song. So you want to go back to Egypt where it's warm and secure. Are you sorry you bought the one way ticket when you thought you were sure? And oh, you're nothing but eat to eat but manna. We should we eat manna all day. I don't you know the rest of it? And we're not uh, 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 eating manna souffle. Well, it's a hard one to do, but I would pick an easier one. Like, <laughs> all right. Well, well, I do. Have, we do have a songbook. We could. We, <laughs> one of the classics. All right. Okay. Let's see if we can bring up a classic. I might have to sing to all the women here. What? So. <laughs> no, I don't think that would be a suitable. <laughs> What? Oceans. I don't know that one. Nympha knows it. Oceans? Do you know Oceans? Do you have it on there? I don't have the words. See, the thing is, we, it's, it's, it's kind of like... Uh, that was an interesting morning, wasn't it? <laughs> Bit of interaction. Good. Good for us. Amen. Okay. What will we do? Uh, let's just go to... I'd like to do congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. You can stand and sing are in order. Congratulations. You found the Lord. You found the real life. You've crossed the border. Congratulations. Are in order. Do you know that song? Anyone know it? Start with that. We may not have it on the on the thing. Don't worry too much about it. But anyway, it's quite simple. Congratulations! Look, you look at each other and you tell the person next to you. Congratulations! Are in order? You found the answer. You found the Lord. You found the real life. You've crossed the border.
Amen. It's so great to know that you're in God's house. You're serving the Lord. Hopefully you are serving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name. Don't forget this week we have our uh, Monday night on Zoom. Essential Troops of the Christian Faith. Tuesday night here at, at 7.30 out there. The Bible study starting uh, again in John chapter 8. Uh, Wednesday night, driving at 7 o'clock. Thursday night, women's Bible study at 7 o'clock. And finally, if you're free on Friday night, we're going to have a business meeting at 7.30. Okay? Perfect. Got that? Good stuff. Amen. God bless. Thank you.